The first thing I'd like to do is the review of the minutes. Anybody's had a chance to review them? Yes, David. I just had a few comments on page three of the minutes. Uh, the second line up from the bottom, there's a reference to maintenance agreement condition. And I believe that's a reference to the condition we uh, agreed upon at the last hearing, which would be that the maintenance agreement be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney. I think the minutes should be changed to reflect that express condition. Okay. And then secondly, on minor issue on page six, uh, about a third of the way up from the bottom, there's a reference to Mr. Charles, and that's actually me, Mr. <laughs> Sherman. <laughs> Uh, where was that? Oh, yeah. This All right. Uh, we, I am actually reading these <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I never doubted you for a second, David. Um, okay. Everybody else agree with those changes? Any other changes? Okay. We have as, as amended. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay. So the minutes are accepted. Let me just quickly go through correspondence. Letter from Fitzpatrick Associates regarding Leighton Farms. A memorandum from Town Planner. Re Comfy Cape Hamlin Street. Letter from K. Newman. Re Comfy Cape Daycare. A letter from S. Blaze. Re Hamlin Street Subdivision. Tonight we were provided with a copy of a letter. Uh, let's see. From MDOT to Diane Morbido, and a fax attached to that is a fax to Tom Greer from Diane Morbido. That's regarding the Cape Elizabeth School Project, and a copy of an email from Russell Tomrose uh, to the planning board, to the town planner. Um, on the agenda tonight, uh, Two items that originally were scheduled for tonight, the Comfy Cape Daycare uh, was tabled to this meeting from the last meeting. The applicant has now chosen not to pursue their amendment and that request is withdrawn. So that is now off the agenda. The Hamlin Street subdivision project, uh, they have requested that that be tabled tonight to come back for the May 18th meeting. So that is also off of tonight's agenda. The remaining issues on the agenda, we have one item on the consent agenda, the Arco Cisco School Site Plan Amendment. Then under Old Business, Cape Elizabeth Commons Site Plan and the Pond Cove uh, Cape High School Addition and Renovation Site Plan and then under new business, the in by the sea site plan amendment. So the first issue uh, for the board is the Arca Cisco school site plan amendment. That is on the consent agenda. Uh, again, I would remind the board that uh, if anyone wishes to have any discussion uh, of this uh, item, then a motion must be made to take it off of the consent agenda uh, does anyone have such a desire? Okay. So that remains on the consent agenda. And let's see. Those are the minutes. Hang on. Here we are. No? Oh, I got it. Okay. Um, so, given the fact that no one wants to put this on the regular agenda, we can deal with it as a consent agenda item. Do I have a motion? Yes. Dave. Uh, a motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Barbara and Harvey Melnick of the Cusco School be for miscellaneous amendments to the previously granted site plan for the school located at 126 Sparrowink Ave be approved. 
Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? <coughs> okay, it's unanimous. And that is approved. The next agenda item is uh, Cape Elizabeth Common Site Plan, a request by ISIS Development. Uh, and as I have in the past, I have to recuse myself on this issue. So, Mr. Sherman, it's all yours. ISIS Development is requesting site plan review of Cape Elizabeth Commons, a 15,000 square foot mixed use building to be located at 316 Ocean House Road. The application was deemed complete and a public hearing is scheduled for this evening. The application will, will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4D3 town center design regulations. At this point, I would ask the applicant to, to describe any changes to the plan since the last presentation. Good evening. My name is Paul Woods, ISIS Development. Um, tonight, um, um, Tom Saucier from Site Design is here with me, um, the civil engineer and project manager. Could you speak um, up, please? Anthony Mench, landscape architect, and Mark Singleman, the architect, is here along with us um, to answer any questions. And to um, and to present um, present drawings tonight, Tom Saucier will um, speak to staff comments and the revisions that were made consistent with those staff comments. Uh, my name is Tom Saucier. I'm a site design consultant. Um, we, since the last, uh, the last review with the planning board, we made uh, a number of revisions, most in response to the uh, very helpful comments we received from staff, as well as uh, just a couple adjustments in the site design, and I'll review those as the chair had suggested. Um, the first revision that we made to the site plan was we relocated the building five feet to the south um, to just better balance the site. You may recall that in the other site plan, we had a stared entrance at this end of the building, and we reworked the site and grades a little bit to bring that grade entrance in over here, and have also provided a, a seat height retaining wall along the south end of the building. Uh, the town engineer, we talked with him, we've added a type one uh, granite inlet to the catch basin in Route 77 to facilitate drainage in that area. The size of the terrace to the front of the building has been increased somewhat. The town engineer had asked us to replace a brick catch basin on, uh, in this area here uh, with a precast structure, and we've, we showed that on the site plan. Uh, the, in the former site plan, um, we had a sidewalk width of five feet along Route 77, and we've um, increase that to six feet per staff comments. Um, we added details on drawing uh, C301 of the um, dumpster enclosure as well as the fencing along the rear of the property. And what we proposed out there is a six foot high um, board fence with a top cap on it and a top rail. And there'll be five by five posts on that and it will be um, stained in Essex green uh, color. We showed the relocated postal drop-off area that's currently on in this area now, uh, relocated to this side of the um, drive. And that was relocated because of the two-way entrance configuration that we're proposing in this area. And the town engineer had also added, asked us to add a note to the plans to clarify that the backfill in the esplanade would be acceptable to tree growth as opposed to just putting some sort of gravel material in there, which we have called out on the plan. And we also referred to MDOT specifications on our details, which was another comment um, requested by the town engineer for us to include in the site plan. Uh, that, I 
think summarizes the revisions to the site plan. Um, the architect is here to talk about um, the building design um, a little bit if the board wishes. Sure. I'm Mark Singleman, architect with Port City Design, Portland, Maine. Um, there have been very few changes to the building itself. Uh, there was some question in the preliminary uh, discussions as to uh, where the air conditioning units were going to go. Um, with this building being visible on four sides, um, not really having a strong front, back, or side, um, we didn't want to have the air conditioning units down on the ground and so what we're proposing is a uh, small area on the roof uh, that we could mount these these units up in up in this area it would be screened with a balustrade uh, to uh, appropriately uh, mask that the sound and um, any hot air exhausted of course would be uh, out of the way of any pedestrians and vehicles um, there was also some comment from staff um, and Antonio will get into this um, about this walkway, we've taken a look at um, how the circulation is going to go. And one of the things that since the last time you saw it, the Mercantile Plaza has been expanded um, back to its original design size so that we have four trees out there. As you can see, there's a very nice alcove here, and the building responds quite well to the town hall. Um, the, the building is designed in such a way that it appears to be two volumes uh, interconnected well it's really just one building but we wanted to keep the scale consistent with the town hall and not overpower it with one large facade um, and those are really the, the major building points the one question that I'd like to address it has to do with site lighting um, originally we put together a proposal with the decorative light fixtures that are in and around this building and we had proposed to use those um, throughout the project and and they're shown here at the rear of the site as well as three across the front what we did is we looked at the lighting levels and we felt like they were quite low um, with this, there, there are some that are 0.1 in the center of the parking lot. Well, 0.1 is about moonlight. So we didn't feel as comfortable with the uh, overall lighting. The average lighting with this scheme is half of a foot candle on the entire site. And what we proposed was to come back with actually fewer fixtures, but one, two, three, four shoebox fixtures and one, two, three of the decorative light fixtures. The decorative light fixtures are consistent with the town character. They're on the front. Uh, the height is consistent and, and the lighting levels are good. But we've raised the overall lighting value from half a foot candle to a 1.0 or a foot full foot candle with fewer light fixtures. And the shoebox type light fixtures um, are, are better equipped to light the parking lot um, and keep the cutoff so that there's not any light that passes over the property line consistent with the zoning guidelines. So that's, that's what we did. I saw that in Maureen's memo she had um, prepared some notation that we can, that would, would be to go back to having the all decorative light fixtures. Now the difference is that there would be two additional light fixtures. Um, they would use more energy and they'd have less lighting output and the parking lot would be darker. So I think, um, you know, as, as professional consultants, we would recommend the, the shoebox fixtures around the rear of the property and the decorative fixtures in the front. But if you feel uh, as a board that that is um, 
that the aesthetics of the polls themselves are outweigh uh, this approach, then we'd be happy to uh, reconsider that. Okay? Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Tony Mensch to talk about some of the landscape upgrades. They didn't leave me much to talk about. I mean, <laughs> I just wanted to point out a couple of things that are primary, I think, in the design that I'd like to just harp on. I'm sort of a tree person, and one of them is, I think, along the street, we, we tried to keep three large trees to reflect the opposite side of the street, so we have sort of an alley of, end up with an alley of trees, if you will, going down 77. I'd also like to point out that on this property line here, we're trying to keep all the, as much of the existing vegetation as we can, except for this huge poplar tree at the end, and we show removing that. It's a multi-trunk tree right at the corner up here, and putting in a sugar maple, a large sugar maple, maple there in, in lieu of that. Because that was, I know, in, during the early process, was one of the things that everybody wanted to talk about, to keep as much of this naturalized area here as we could. Um, see, some of the other things I, this is my favorite part of the project, just in terms of landscape, is the courtyard. And we, we do have a, it isn't specked out yet, but a pedestrian bench. And I think the scale of the planting there, we're trying to keep fairly slow and quiet, if you will, low junipers, et cetera. I'm trying to make it a people place along the front. There's really not a lot that uh, hasn't been covered both by the engineer and the architect, unless there's questions, there's specific questions. At this point, we're going to move on to, to a public hearing, unless there's okay. any further introductory remarks from the applicant. Yep. We do have a public hearing scheduled for tonight, so I will now open the public hearing. If anybody here would like to make a comment, please step up to the, the podium. And if you could just identify yourself by name and, and where you live, please. My name is Mary Page, and I live at 172 Two Lights Road. And I also own a business, Two Lights General Store, located at 517 Ocean House Road, which is the old Rudy's of the Cape. I had a question and a comment. My question was, um, regarding this building, as I sat over there, I counted out 28 parking spaces. And for a 15,000 square foot building, 28 parking spaces. And I was just curious on how it's going to be worked out where they're going to be sharing the lot with the town hall. If you could answer that. Sure, I think I will deflect your question to the town planner because I know there has been a discussion about the number of parking spaces mm -hmm. and whether this complied with the ordinance. Go to my notes. Yeah. Um, under the ordinance, if we break up every use that's proposed, we have um, office space that would require 23 spaces, retail space that would require 14 spaces, restaurant space that would require 15 spaces, and four dwelling units, uh, which would require six spaces. So that's a total of 58 spaces. However, uh, the applicant has contracted with the town to share 18 spaces that are in the rear of the town hall. And we've monitored the use of the town hall during the day when we expect the demand on uh, the abutting use to be the highest. And at any one time, there's at least 25 open spaces behind town hall during the day. So we feel that committing 18 spaces to possible use by this applicant is, is still within the range. Uh, in addition, without taking it into consideration, uh, the board could also look at the, the fact that the dwelling units are probably going to demand their parking mostly in the evenings and in the weekends and not be there during the day, for the most part, and that the office space is probably going to have the most number of, of demand on their spaces during the day. So there is some opportunity within here to look at some shared parking where you could count a space for two uses and require fewer spaces. Uh, with, with the additional 18 parking spaces in the rear and the 46 spaces that are on site on that lot, you have a total of 64 spaces, and under the ordinance you need 58. So when when you say contracted, means 
they're going to be leasing this from you. They're going to be paying for plowing. They're going to be paying for the lot. Actually, it's, it's an agreement that's a part of the sale of the lot by the town to the applicant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, one thing I've noticed, and I, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, we own a coffee shop that's been in this town for 40 years. And Cumberland Farms has coffee shop. IGA has coffee shop. Everything we read about this building, which is beautiful and fabulous and is going to be a great asset to the town, everybody has said in, in writing in the papers that this town needs a good coffee shop and that you know, pretty soon nobody's going to have to drive to South Portland to do this. And my feeling of this is if, if the town is going to be sharing this lot, well then if a coffee shop goes in here, I'm paying for my competitor's parking out of my tax dollar. And that's where it comes in, and that it's, you know, the town is focusing more on what it needs, which is the commercial space and the apartment dwellings. And so that's why I was voicing on that one tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other parties wishing, wishing to comment during the public hearing? Seeing none, we'll bring the public hearing to a close. Uh, and at this point, I would invite board members, if they have any questions for the applicant or issues to raise, to do so now. I'd like to ask the applicant a question. Um, you know, it may be something that was covered before, and I apologize if it has, but I'm... That's fine. I'm new on the planning board too, so um, in terms of utilization of the space, looking at your interior layout, um, I was trying to figure out where the restaurant would be, and I didn't see any space indicated as divided for or perhaps by the utilities for a kitchen. Is there a, is there a kitchen space someplace here that I have? Uh, Right. It's not the actual interior layout of the building hasn't been um, hasn't been finally determined in terms of partition structure where something's located. But I can tell you the sector that it is in, and it is in this section here. It's been designated as retail, okay. but it's closest to the town hall. If you were to see the building, and from this perspective, yeah. it would be on the first floor, okay. on this side, facing the town hall sharing the driveway. Okay. There used to be, at some point, um, Mark, Mark and Tom mentioned that this elevation facing the town hall um, had a step. In other words, it was a step, but the closer we looked at the elevations facing the town hall, and you can see down there there's a small stone retaining wall. The elevation is actually Mm, at least four feet, four or five feet different than what the town hall is. This building, it looks flat. It looks like it continues flat across. And there was going to be stairs going up there. But not only didn't it look good aesthetically, it seemed like it would cause problems in terms of pedestrian traffic flow. But the restaurant itself will be in that first floor of the section here facing the town hall. Is it potentially a space that would also go front and back in the building? I, I was just trying to understand. I realize you don't perhaps have a tenant yet identified. But. It's approximately if it, it's approximately 1,500 square feet in that area. And it could go front and back, yes. Okay, that's what I was wondering. If, yes, it could go front and back. It could go. Depending on what the use is, it, it, it may not call for that much. And as it's finally segmented out, it may go a little bit less. But I'm planning for it. I'm planning for it. Could go that section. It's not going to go more than the building. More of the building is not going to be devoted for that kind of use. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> David, I, I have a question for the landscape portion of it, if I could. <clears throat> Um, you went over that tree removal a little quickly. I wondered if you'd talk about it a little more. Is that the one that's presently a large tree at the corner of the lot? Right, it's the it, multi trunk it's Close to the house next to it. Is that, is that sort of an aged tree? Uh, 
pretty much seen its better days? Well, the nature of the, the kind of tree it is, along with the fact that it's multi-trunk and spread out as it is, it, it's, it, is become, it, would, it will become a problem. It might not be right now. It does, it's deceiving because it has sort of an attractive form, just based on when you, when you look at it as a, as a nice specimen. But poplar generally are pretty susceptible when they get that size of dying off fairly quickly. Uh, in the Esplanade, I think I read this as that you're putting three trees in the Esplanade? Right. Okay. Um, and they're listed as what? C3, maple. red maples? Okay. Is there going to be any light fixtures in the Esplanade? I think there are, and I know that I talked with the engineer about putting the conduit underneath the edge of the actual sidewalk and you know, tucking it to one side so we can put those trees in there and not have the so, not have them on top of the wiring. So will you mark on the final plans a location for the fixtures? Is that what you plan to do? Right. Okay. Um, and then I got a question of the architect relative to the light fixtures. <clears throat> David, can I ask a question of the landscape architect? Okay. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. No, Go ahead. Good. Uh, I was just curious. The four large trees that are out front, uh, what, what's the height intended to be of those when they first go in? When they first go in, it'll be about three and a half, four inch caliper. They might be like 15 feet, okay. 14 feet. Sometime they're like cut back a little bit, like you you know trimmed off and shaped. Yeah. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Light fixtures? Shoebox fixture. Are we, is, that, is that the one shown in our detail here? Uh, let me see if I can find it. I just was curious. As to... Okay, so that... <clears throat> and what, what height are we talking about? 14-foot poles. Okay. So they're not very high. If we want to get really good lighting here, we'll go up to 20-foot poles, but we wanted it to be consistent with the town center. Well, not, not knowing what's going to go on in the back, uh, I just, 14 foot would be more than enough in my opinion. Yeah. But I, but I was just, I, I think our concern originally was to try to keep with the theme in the center of town, but I think lighting is very important in the back, so I don't, I don't really have a problem with that type of a fixture. I don't think you'll be able to see it anyways from the front, but I was curious just to make sure of the fixture. The, the nice thing about those type of fixtures is that your, your eye kind of passes over them. They, they don't stand out. They're not silver. You know, they'll be black and, and, and they'll kind of go away. And the fixtures uh, that you're going to locate on the Esplanade, are they in here? Yeah, they're on the, on the plans, too, and I, I can see point two. them out. Yeah, there they are. Okay, so it's this one. That one. Okay. Would it be this one here? Right there, L, right there. But they're not they're on the, but in other, in other words, they're not on the Esplanade, but they now, are. And the reason that we kept them back there is because that's not our property. And if you'd like us to move them out into the Esplanade, we'd be happy to do that. Well, we, we happen to have an authority on the sidewalks and town. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to pass it. Mario, what do you think? Are you, are you satisfied with them? being a little different than what's across the street? They're, they're right behind the sidewalk? Yes. Right. And, and I would just as soon move them out into the Esplanade because then they would be more visible and provide. So we're, we'd be happy to make that alteration. Yeah, I, I, I mean, as long as you coordinate the installation of the underground uh, wires with, with Public Works, I don't see why the town would be opposed to having them in the Esplanade. Okay. Because we obviously did it on the other side of the street. The Esplanade on the other side of the street is significantly wider than this is. is so, you know, the, the opportunity for damage from plows, other vehicles, et cetera, is greater on our side. We could probably hit them on the other side, too, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> from my standpoint, I think that it would be more consistent to see them in the Esplanade rather than on your property. But that's my feeling like it would make me feel a lot better if they were in the Esplanade than it would look a lot more similar to the other side of the street. Okay. And I guess that's all the questions I had. 
Thank you. While we're on the issue of the, the lights, is there is there a safety concern with using the is it the Philadelphia series light that's going to be out used out in front? Correct. Is there any safety concern with having those lights in, in the back in a parking lot? The main difference is that with seven of those light fixtures, we get half a foot candle average illumination in the rear parking lot or in, on the site, basically. And if we go to the shoebox, we get 1.0 or a full foot candle, so we'll have twice as much lighting. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those little numbers where it says 0.01, that's a tenth of a foot candle, which is basically moonlight. And, and there's some 0.01s in the middle of the parking lot. We'd like to see a higher lighting level back there for safety concerns. And I was kind of surprised when I looked out here tonight that there are two of those light fixtures in your parking lot. And I believe those are 14 foot poles, but I don't know what the wattage is on those. Do you know? Oh, they're 18s? Okay. You know, I understand the point <coughs> versus the point 0.5, but point 0.5 is actually a lot brighter. I mean, I, I stood outside in a lighting workshop in Burlington, Vermont, and could read the fine print on my license at point 0.5 foot candles. So it's, it's a lot more than it sounds like. And I, to the board, I, I just need to say that you know, we don't ever get complaints from people that they don't have enough lighting. We usually hear complaints that there's too much light shining into their neighbor's yards. So just to keep that in mind. And I, I would reiterate that both of these lighting schemes have uh, 0.5 or less foot candles at the property line. So they, they both comply with the town ordinance. My inclination would be to favor using the, the same type of lighting fixtures in both the front and the back of the building and try to keep it consistent with the town center. I don't know how other members of the board come out on that issue. And my understanding is the applicant is willing to do either. Correct. Do it either way. Well, my purpose as is yours would be for the same type of fixtures in both front and back. I'm, I'm, could you My that? preference would be the same as his, to have okay. the same type of fixtures okay. front and rear. I hate to come down on the other side, but I guess my inclination is more of the safety issue, and I, I would be more inclined to have the shoebox and the higher wattage, but it's not that significant an issue to me that... But it looks like I'm getting outvoted anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know. We have uh, five, five board members, so uh, maybe we can keep it a mystery until Peter makes a motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't aware that you would do either. Oh, well, sure we will. And if you would, and if you could keep it consistent with the other light fixtures that are so presently here in the back, it, it would be nice. Um, I'm not against using the shoebox for safety purpose, but if you can, uh, if you're willing to do both, it would be consistent with what's out back here. Okay. Be nice. I just had a few additional questions that were alluded to in the town planner's memorandum. I think this goes to the landscape architect. There's mention of the uh, islands in the rear parking lot of the of the building, and. Uh, Plans do not appear to contain a street tree in the islands uh, in the rear parking lot. And I'm wondering if, if the plans have been revised to reflect her comment. I think that was, if Mark might correct me, but I do. We have a street light here and a tree on the far side, but that's it. Just the uh, location of the street light. So that's the not to have one with a light. That's not to say that there couldn't be, you know, intermediate or pretty good sized shrubs there. To have like lilac against the fence in the back all the way along, and we could definitely add some plant material there. Is that the island to which you're referring? My understanding is that the, the center design, the town center design, requires that there be a tree planted in, in that island. Would a, would a lilac? I mean, we could put several lilacs there. It's got to be a street tree, okay. It has to be a street tree? Okay. 
that something that you think no, that's, you could accommodate? And right, definitely. Uh, there is also in the in section N of the memorandum a discussion about the the, the plantings uh, in the area next to the town hall. And uh, my understanding is you've had some discussion with the town staff about that issue. Are you talking about right along the, the edge of the town offices? That's correct. The walk? And again, my understanding was that we were going to be with using ground covers on either side of the walkway where it separates from the curb and goes around this way and goes into the park and it be like hostas, variety of hostas. But we could expand that to other shade liking ground cover plant material. I think hostas are fine. That's right. Is there any other issue on that? Okay. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> David? Um, I don't think we've discussed in great depth at all, but is the drawing that's on the floor, does that depict the color scheme and the materials that are going to be in the exterior of the building? If you haven't, would you briefly go over that for us? I can. Um, no, it does not fully reflect the color scheme. Um, basically, what we did for this until we had made a final decision was uh, render it in earth tones and something that's going to be um, complementary to the town hall. We're certainly not going to use yellow. Um, <coughs> but uh, so we, well, we haven't really nailed that down, but the, all the materials will be consistent with the town center guidelines. The, uh, the, we'll have a wood cedar clapboard siding, asphalt. Uh, roof shingles, wide painted uh, wooden corner boards. Um, we'll have some concrete pavers in the um, uh, mercantile plaza and as well as maybe some granite pavers underneath the trees. Those aren't tree grates. Those are, uh, we find that the, the, the granite pavers move better with tree, with tree roots, etc. And um, they're not so um, inflexible. As a, as a tree grade. Um, other, other materials, um, um, obviously we'll have some, some windows that will not be tinted. Um, and anything else you'd like? No, that's to about it. I, it just is, I guess you did briefly talk about the clapboards and, and, and that kind of structure. If that's, that's in keeping with the Senate Town uh, uh, guidelines I think it's fine as far as I'm concerned. There may be, there may be some uh, shingles yeah. uh, in a few areas but what we've, what we've tried to do is um, give, give you a, a, a beautiful building that is um, the equal of the town hall or, or greater so that as the town center uh, revitalizes and hopefully the shopping center across the street may follow suit one of these days. Um, hopefully. We'll, we'll get a lot of uh, uh, more interesting architecture in the downtown. Certainly beats an empty parking lot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's for sure. The, the center section exactly. of the building, um, are, are these cedar shingles on the center section of the building? Yes. Will they be stained or painted the same color as the cloudboards? Or? Uh, they'll, they'll probably be painted uh, a solid body stain, or stain, stained a solid body stain. Uh, and whether it's the same color or probably in the center section will probably be a little bit different so that we get a little bit of <coughs> contrast. Peter? Back to the lighting issue. <laughs> um, the, the, the four that you're proposing on the shoebox design, three of them, as I understand, are directly behind the building, uh -huh. correct? Okay, so the only one you'll see from the street So the only one you'll see from the street is the, <coughs> the one on the most the northern that's part. That's the only one that would be visible okay. from the street. The, there's, there's one that's, that's here. I suppose you can see that from the street. Mm. But certainly these two are, are not as visible. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Maybe they have a motion for the board. I just, oh, go just ahead, Dave. one other comment. I, um, I would like to comment on Mr. Wood's effort to provide a, a nice structure in the center of town, but I'd also like to say it's nice that people will spend the time to come to a hearing and make their comments heard. I don't think that I thought originally, or not my thought, that this building was being built to have a coffee shop, but, um, <clears throat> and it may never come to pass, depending on whether somebody thinks it's a business. But as far as the structure is concerned, uh, and the addition of the town, uh, to me it's a welcome addition. Look forward to seeing it. I second that comment. Does anybody have a motion for the board at this point? <clears throat> David. A motion for the board to consider findings of fact. ISIS development, uh, parentheses, Paul Woods is requesting site plan review of Cape Elizabeth Commons, a 15,000 square foot mixed use building to be located at 316 Ocean House Road, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. The sidewalk and esplanade included on the plans is partially located on the applicant's lot. The visual continuity, which includes a consistent light fixture style, is part of the purpose of the town center district and a goal of the town center plan. The town center design requirements mandate that no more than 10 parking spaces be proposed in a row without an island planted with a street tree. The area immediately north of the town hall will be redesigned and the surface treatment should be clearly identified in, on the plans. The application uh, substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4 D3 town center design requirements. Be it ordered that based on the plans and the material submitted and the facts presented, the application of ISIS development for site plan review of Cape Elizabeth Common, Commons, a 15,000 square foot mixed use building of 5,700 square feet office space, 2,500 square feet retail space, and 1,800 square feet restaurant, and a four multi-family dwelling units to be located at 316 Ocean House Road be approved subject to the following conditions. That a public access easement in the form of an acceptable to the town attorney and approved by the town manager be provided for the area along the front of the property where the sidewalk is located. That the lighting fixture in the parking lot, or the lighting fixtures in the parking lot be consistent with the town center style fixture. That a street tree be planted in the islands in the rear parking lot. And that the plans be revised to consistently show the area on the north side of the town hall with a specified quantity of hosta planning and a walkway and that there be no issuance of a building permit until the above conditions have been met. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? I just want to understand, given what we said about the lighting, this is a motion to approve the plans as submitted with the lighting just the way it is. Is that... Um, just so we have clearly on the table what we're voting on. Is that... I thought that the condition number two dealt with that issue that the that the lighting fixtures be consistent with the town style, excuse me, the town center style fixture. If that's the way that it's, I, I, it's a, yeah. the intent of I was referring to the town center style fixture as the fixtures that were being proposed in the front of the building, and that the fixtures used in the front of the building would also be the fixtures that would have to be okay. used in the rear of the building. That's, that's fine as long as I just want to understand what I'm voting on. If that's the uh, intent of the motion, I, that's fine. The only issue I raise is whether this addresses the issue of the location of the, the lighting fixtures in front of the building. We had some discussion about them being in the esplanade versus immediately on the other side of the sidewalk. Are, are we going to, how are we going to handle that? Yeah, that isn't addressed by this, but if the applicant wants to move them, you probably want to add another condition to this motion. 
one quick question. Um, Mr. Griffin's motion was very balanced, but unless I heard it incorrectly, the conditions would have to be met before a building permit was issued. Uh, agreed to. You did. Agreed to. Conditions agreed to before a building permit. That's the certificate of occupancy. So the way that you would meet the condition would be to revise the plans to show that that you were going to be building it that way, and that would con that would constitute meeting the condition. Then you can get your building permit. The issue is: Are we are we going to require as a condition that the the lighting fixtures in front of the building be located in the esplanade? Are we going to make that something that that they may do? At their option or for some other version. Personally, I have no strong feeling on that one way or the other. It doesn't really matter to me. Obviously, Dave's expressed a preference to have it closer if he. I know the applicant raised some issue about perhaps it's not being feasible Go ahead. Right, or ideal. May I make just one comment? Uh, Sincerely, I will move them to the front on that side of the esplanade for consistency. There's no, there's no real issue in terms of um, disagreeing with that. The only comment I'd like to make is that these are fairly expensive fixtures, uh, more expensive than I first, um, first realized. And the closer you get toward the road, the more fragile they are. And, um, and again, there is a balance going on between consistency in terms of what's on the other side. But it is true that that esplanade is considerably wider, um, or, or somewhat wider, I should say. And uh, either way, I'll comply either way. But these, these, these light fixtures are, I think they can be sort of delicate. And uh, having said that, either way is perfectly fine. It's a very balanced motion, and I'll, I'll comply with whatever the board wishes. How, how far from the curbing would they be if they were in the esplanade area? I mean, in, that, in the esplanade there? In the esplanade. How far would it be? Ordinarily, you center them, really. I mean, you have to balance aesthetically between where the sidewalk is and where the curbing is. So you would send that green strip right there on the street side of the sidewalk. Right. It would be centered in there, which it gets them pretty close to the road. That's what I'm asking. You know, is it, are we talking three feet or something like that? Two and a half, three and a half feet, feet from the road? Yeah. I mean, again... Either way is fine. I'm not. I'm not trying to be to be difficult on this particular issue, but they are. They're they're pretty. They're very. They're um. They're architectural type fixtures. They're not light poles per se. They're they're um. They're special in a way. So further back they are, and it's really not that far to the other side of the sidewalk. They'll be a lot safer and happier. But having said that, it'll. Be, I'm very happy to go in between the sidewalk. <coughs> David. I would, after hearing that and also looking at the plans, the uh, esplanade across the street is about seven feet of grass, and on the side of the new building, it's five feet, so it's two feet less. And I, I agree with Mr. Woods that they become a lot more fragile that close to the sidewalk. So, and if he's if they're as close to the sidewalk on this property as shown in this drawing, I don't have a problem. With it. That's only my opinion. Um, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I would be willing to approve the application with the front light fixtures in, in the location that they're already uh, in on the plans. Anybody else? So there's no amendment necessary. Correct. No. So a motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I look forward to this. Thank you very much.
All right, the next issue uh, on the agenda tonight is the request by the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of an addition to Pond Cove Elementary School and renovations to the high school and related improvements. Um, this application has already been deemed complete. Public hearing was held and tonight it is uh, up for review for compliance pursuant to section 19-9 site plan regulations. Uh, we could begin just by uh, updating us on any changes to the plans from the last meeting. That would be great. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Before we begin, I do need to recuse myself from consideration of this application. That's right. The sure. firm represents the school department. Thank you. My, my name is Tom Greer from Pinkham and Greer, and with me tonight is Bob Howe from HKTA, uh, the architect for the project. Uh, since the last time the board has seen this project, it has uh, gone to the town council, and a light has been approved at the intersection. And so part of our, our plan is to install that light and make sure that's, that's part of it. Um, we have also been dealing with the DEP, and the phone message I got today from Doug Burdick is that the, the DEP permit has been typed up. It has been sent to Augusta to be signed, and we should get it either Monday or possibly Friday. Um, so that's, that's in the works. With your approval tonight, hopefully that's where we're headed, um, then this project will go out to bid and we'll receive bids in a couple of weeks on Pond Cove School and then we'll start the construction. Um, we have made a few changes that the staff had asked for in terms of detailing some of the plazas and some of the outside landscaping issues and those have been, been addressed. Um, there is an outstanding issue with, uh, with uh, planting on the side of the steep slope behind the student parking lot and it's my understanding from Pat Carroll that he and Bob Malley have come to an agreement that that slope will be planted with Rosa Ragosa, so that will be part of part of our plan versus the sumac that's on the drawing right now, so that the, the two of them have met and we're willing to do that. Um, and the uh, sidewalk thickness and MDOT specifications that Bob had asked for will be added to the, to the final plans as part of it. Um, I think the uh, only other outstanding issue that, that probably will warrant some discussion is the timing of the, the light that will go in at the intersection. Um, in Maureen's memo uh, on the item one on the first page, I think there's a, there's a typo, at least I'm hoping it's a typo. Uh, the applicant has further indicated that no special time considerations. Um, actually, it sh I think that should be that there is a time consideration for this light. Um, what we would want to do is make sure that um, the town has the option of going after some grant money through PACS and that the timing of the light be based on when the PACS money is available to, to participate in that, that, that process. We, we believe that substantial completion on this project will be January of 2006 and so that um, we look at the, the light being installed either the summer of 2005, which probably won't meet the timing of the PACS money, or the summer of 2006 is probably a better target date for the light to be installed. And I think that, that fits better with, with funding availability and with the practicality of being able to uh, install the light. Um, with, with that issue, I think we're, we're pretty much up to date and be happy to answer questions. Um, yeah, l let's talk about that issue. I, I think that's important. Uh, I guess, first of all, for purposes of uh, clarity, I assume that now there is, Maureen, a formal plan for the intersection, which will be part of these plans and will be approved at some point. I realize that it's not yeah. final, but how, how can we I believe handle that, that? Yeah, I don't think... I think what the applicant has submitted in terms of the most recent correspondence <coughs> received is all they intend to submit because what they have is evidence that there's a vote that's been taken by the town council committing the town to installing a light and there, the assumption is that that's sufficient for you. There's no plan that shows there will be a light. There is, right, there is written documentation that's been added to the file that says, you know, we agree to install a light. Okay. Well, I think I think if we can, 
if we can approve the project referencing a light at that location and the left turn lane we may want to be a little more specific about where that is just so the record's clear but I think we all know what we're talking about where the left turn lane would be and where the light would be but it should be at least in my opinion a little bit clearer in the wording and it, in your indulgence um, what I talked about in terms of the timing I believe our, our conversation I don't know if it was with you at one point we had said that there was no need for there to be any delay that's what I was told um, but the intent has always been that whatever time the town needs to fully exhaust grant opportunities and then get the light designed and installed is what should be incorporated as part of the proposal for the planning board to approve so um, it wasn't I think what was discussed was not to leave it open-ended that the town would install it at some point but that, the ta that, that we would pick a date that would give the town plenty of time to do everything it needed to do to make sure they had exhausted every grant opportunity but then there would be an, 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 an offset point beyond which the board would establish a deadline and if the deadline in here is not the right deadline then we should in, in, in substitute a better one that works for the project I think that's correct I think we do need a different date right now on page two of the item one it says uh, certificate of occupancy um, because the high school is continually occupied through the through the process as we renovate it there's no really official date there um, the project will be substantially complete uh, January of uh, 2006 um, we don't think that the funds are going to be available so what I think is the is the reasonable date would be the summer of 2006 would be the, the likely date that we need to to get the light in, in place um, clearly if, if funding doesn't work out by then we can always come back and explain why it's why it's not in and ask for a change from the board at that time um, but I think that's a reasonable date to, to start with so July 1 2006 would be what the town would be looking for um, I'd probably make it later in the in the year probably somewhere around October December 30th. so that it so that it, <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay yeah Bob Mr. Chairman, could, could we have him identify himself on the record? Thank yes. You. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I know who he is, but I maybe know. nobody. Else. I'm Robert Howe. I'm the architect for the project. Um, I just wanted to uh, discuss this schedule. Um, we had I had talked to the town planner just after our last meeting and um, wanting to know, you know, what can we provide or get in a timely sort of way that to the board that would answer that question about the um, um, installation of the light. And our discussion was that perhaps a, uh, giving the process of getting PAC money and those applications and, and, and what has to be done, if the town council said, okay, do this, we want this done, um, then we should probably be looking at something um, about a year after the date of substantial completion of the project. And that will give us a, a window to start the design uh, of those, or whoever does the design of that intersection and in conjunction with the uh, application process and at least finding them funds at the, at the risk of dragging this out so that it, just so I understand that the deadline Maureen would be a deadline to submit plan and have it approved or to have the signal installed I guess I'm getting lost here as to what I, the deadline is going to apply to I guess I was a little concerned that there are no plans but the assumption would be that a plan would be prepared that would actually show the installation of a left turn lane and where it's supposed to be and um, you know that involves some construction and there ought to be some review of that so I had written the motion targeted to creation of the plans assuming that we wouldn't prepare plans if we weren't actually going to put the light in if the board is uncomfortable with that approach you certainly can go with a deadline that the actual light be installed but what, uh, but what, what, is, what were you? I was thinking about when the actual light had to be installed. Yeah, I, I would prefer that. I don't know what the rest of the board 
deals because if if it's just a plan then who knows yeah. you know that money may want to be used some, for something else and someone could say well we submitted the plan but we're not putting in the light so uh, I'd like to keep it to a deadline by which the lights installed I don't mind pushing the deadline out so that we're sure that we can get the funding and have it all done but and, and, and if for some reason the town needed more time they could come in with a modification to the plan request sure that summer or something right so but we were setting up the deadline first and if they need more time if they're back here I, I'd like to see a deadline for the well, that's, actual that's fine installation. the installation so I would yeah I would too concept was based on so right and and so now that is first of 06 is that word I'm I'm suggesting December 31st 2006 December 31st 06 and that's consistent with what you think you can do and I assume that if things come together before that it, it would be done sooner yes I, I don't know who's going to actually be doing the designing of that whether the town engineers will or the town will turn to us and ask the design team of the <coughs> high school project to do it but that would be you know as soon as the monies look like they're available I think that that would happen all right anything else on that issue um, the, the other issue that I, I don't think we've touched on but I also would favor the suggestion uh, I believe it was in the town engineers letter about flexibility and the uh, location of the, the modular classrooms um, do you want to talk about that a little bit so everybody knows yes what, uh, originally we had submitted a plan to the board uh, a year and a half or so ago and got it approved for two particular modulars that the school had in mind uh, in purchasing um, but they've been going through trying to get some modulars lined up and they're different sizes depending on who you talk to and what they have available so what we're asking for is some flexibility in the placement of those modulars and the size of those modulars so that whatever they find for the best deal they can set up in the in in the best format to make it work uh, out behind the school so they're in they're going to be in the same general location but whether they're parallel to the school or perpendicular to the school may change depending on the, the stairs and ramps and that type of thing okay and and you're comfortable with I, I see in here and I agree that it would still be subject to the approval of the fire chief and the public works director yeah, that's fine that's fine Maureen is that specific enough so that will work okay anybody else have any comments on that issue modulars just a question uh, we, we did talk a lot about these you know, so long ago I guess we I forget most of it but they're only temporary that's correct during construction what, just the construction they'll yeah. be out of there after that's correct so then and they meet all the standards of the ventilation and all that yes okay that, is there any utilities outside other than uh, getting power to them is that underground or is that going to be about um, that will be I believe underground there is power available right there on the side of the building that I think will be extended over to them uh, they do not have water facilities okay they're simply classrooms all right. Thank you. That's all I have. <clears throat> Anybody else have any other questions or comments? I, I see in, uh, that you've addressed the issues that the town engineers have <coughs> raised, and uh, we certainly appreciate that in terms of the landscaping. And I, I do want to commend the town and all the interests involved in uh, coming to a resolution on the on the traffic issue I know was uh, there was a lot a lot to consider and I think this is a, a good resolution and will certainly add to the project to have the traffic uh, problem taken care of Ready Peter? for a motion? I'm always ready. Um, I have a motion for the board to consider that we make the following findings of fact. That the town of Case Elizabeth is requesting site plan review for an addition to the Pond Cove Elementary School and renovations to the high school and related improvements. 
which require review under Section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, the project includes the installation of a traffic light and a left turn lane <clears throat> on Route 77, which will require some alteration of the intersection. Three, the town engineer has requested that a sidewalk detail and proposed planting bed should be further revised. Four, that the applicant is still adjusting the final configuration of modular classrooms that will be temporarily installed on the site. And five, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4.D.3, the town center design requirements. And that further, that, uh, that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of an addition to the Pond Cove Elementary School located on Scott Dyer Road and renovations to the high school located on Ocean House Road and related improvements be approved with the following conditions. One, that the traffic light installation and related improvements be completed prior to December 31st, 2006. And two, that the final configuration and size of the modular classrooms to be installed on the northeast side of the high school be approved by the fire chief and the public works director, and three, that the plans be revised per the town engineer's comments. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. That is approved. Thank you. Uh, our next agenda item under new business is uh, in by the sea request for site plan amendment to increase the limit on function size from 176 guests to 320 guests. Uh, this request will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Uh, I, I would remind the board that though uh, formal finding of completeness isn't required, I think one, one thing we should do tonight is determine if we have enough information or what we may do to get sufficient information to be able to uh, review this uh, amendment. So uh, with that, I'd like to hear from the applicant. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Stephen Moore. I'm a principal with Moore and Sheridan Landscape Architects in Portland. With me this evening are Susan Legg of Susan Legg Events um, from the Inn and Greg Schinberg with Olympia Equity um, Investments, one of the owners of the Inn. What I'd like to do is just take a few minutes and walk the board through the process of how we arrived here and then come back and talk about the specifics of this particular project. Um, as the board recalls, in November, um, two Novembers passed, the board approved the uh, changes to the inn for allowing up to 176 guests at the inn <clears throat> based on the on-site parking um, that we were able to determine through uh, the work with the board that could handle that 176 uh, level of guests. And the board's finding at that time were that um, septic traffic and other issues that were on the site could support uh, that level of guests. The one issue that went through quite a lengthy and long debate was the question of noise and uh, management of noise at the property line. And we went through with the board a very sort of detailed plan about acoustic blankets and in fact put that management plan and the acoustic blanket plan into place um, effective last year, 2003. And Susan's been running the outdoor events um, with those acoustic blankets in place. Um, as <coughs> Approved by the board, those events had to be monitored for noise levels. That was done. Um, in checking with the police department last August, um, we have found no complaints that were, uh, had come into then as they had in the previous several years about noise. Um, and then we checked again uh, just before we made this application to verify, in fact, that there were no at least 
police complaints about noise levels from the infant last year. Um, I think you also know through the regular reporting that the in does on the septic field that the septic field um, has done very, very well in response to um, the peaks and the use of that in through um, the improvements that were put into that system again two and three years ago. And as part of that uh, reconstruction of that system, there has been regular reporting to uh, Bruce Smith. What we've done and what we worked on um, subsequent to that was we came back to you through a workshop and discussed with you in that workshop um, what we wanted to do for off-site parking to accommodate a slightly larger um, gathering out in the grounds. And at that time, we had spoken with you about 235 to about 275 people. And the idea with that was to accommodate those additional parking spaces off-site. We had suggested several locations for that with you. And at that time, the board seemed most comfortable with um, using St. Bart's. The intervening changes in the ordinance, which allowed off-site parking up to a mile away, um, became implemented. So we had the ability then to park off-site and actually support our on-site commercial uses with off-site parking. And we then went through uh, work with the inn to look at event size, um, parking counts, and try and establish a, a longer-term lease than just the one-year um, discussion that we had with the board at that workshop. What we come back to you in this package um, when we made the submission was a request for 320 guests on site, which was really based solely on the procurement of that three-year lease and the 40 spaces at St. Bart's. Subsequent to working on this application and submitting it to you, um, we have had the ability to meet and follow up with the end on other things that are going on at the end um, in association with and in conjunction with the proposed um, event changes. The end is looking at and going through an evaluation of the property in terms of internal renovations and changes and upgrades and simple things, carpets and, and soundproofing and that sort of thing, but they're also looking at other changes in some of the interior functions. Based on those discussions with the inn and discussions with Susan, um, Susan Lake, Susan Lake Events, what we want to do is request from the board that we lower that number from 320 down to 260. And I apologize for bringing that up this evening, but in evaluating the overall proposal since the time we've submitted till now, we've come to the conclusion that we don't want to put the in a position of absolutely running everything based on just the available parking at St. Bart's, that we're trying to balance those events on site and the number of guests based not only on parking, but based on other uses and some of these other things that are being evaluated by the inn. The other piece that factors into that is in talking with Susan and looking at the actual event size and what is programmed and used on the site, they really don't ever bump over about 250 guests. That that's that would be the maximum they could ever really accommodate and consider on that grounds right now. And so rather than let that parking count simply dictate the number that we brought into you, we thought the more reasonable approach would be to back up and say, what is Susan really looking at in that event? What is in those events? What is the inn willing to accept in terms of number of guests on the site? And that number ends up around 250. The reason we get to 260 is we're looking at those additional staff people that would actually support that change from 176 to 250. So where we are this evening is we request um, from the board that that 320 number be lowered down to um, 260, in other words, drop that by 60 guests, still leaving the lease and the 40 spaces available at St. Bart's, but allowing that number to more accurately reflect what would actually occur at the end um, should this board find favorably on this application. In terms of backing up and looking at existing information that's on the record, at the time that we went through um, the application, what we submitted to you was that in terms of on-site parking, there were a, hundred and, a total of 104 spaces. 43 of those would actually be dedicated to um, the parking for events. The restaurant would get 
shut down and that restaurant function would in turn support those guest and catered event functions on the site. What that meant to us was we really needed to supplement that parking and in our discussions with Susan, we came up with that number of can we get 25 or 30 spaces. The reality of St. Bart's was they came back with that offer um, at that higher number and the decision was we should really take that because of the flexibility that provided the inn. So we know that in terms of the parking that we have available now of um, those 83 spaces that are available plus the on-site and guest, that we can support comfortably um, easily that 260 to 280 people in addition to the guests that would be um, in the units themselves. The other piece we've looked at are the uh, septic capacity issues associated with this project. In the breakdown that was provided to you in the original application, we indicated to you that there was uh, 2,000 gallons per day that was dedicated to the events at the end that was in the submission from Albert Frick. And that uh, the restaurant itself had an additional 1,375 gallons that was associated with its septic flow. Um, again, in that information from Albert Frick. So that in terms of the functioning of the inn on those days when there's events, there's 3,375 gallons of uh, septic capacity available on site. And in looking at these figures and looking at the previously uh, examined information that was submitted, what we're saying is that that gallonage flow of six to seven GPD for these event patrons is still the same figure that um, we want to bring forward and present to this board. And again, if you run the numbers out at 260 at that higher number of seven gallons per day, we're still well below that 3,375 gallons um, that's on the record as available capacity. Uh, the last issue to talk about is simply one of traffic, um, which although associated with on-site parking, um, still is an issue. In the information that Bill Bray had presented to you, he had looked at uh, parking and attendance somewhere between 175 and 200 people on the site. And his documentation submitted to you at that time indicated that even at those numbers, the level of service still stayed at level of service A in and out of the driveway. The site distance that he reported on that obviously isn't affected, but level of service um, at that point still stayed at level of service A. So our belief is that um, in terms of those sort of three key components, the noise, traffic, septic parking, that we had information on record with you that supported um, the larger request. But again, our request tonight is consideration for that lower number. Um, last thing just to touch on in terms of this particular proposal and what uh, the inn is trying to do is that the function of the inn and, and the way it's been working is that when we came forward with the 176, we understood very well that we really wanted that additional uh, 40 to 60 to 70 patrons on there because some of the demand was there. And that's what led us back to that workshop. We still have that belief that if the town can see the merits of the business allowing to um, stay and thrive there at those levels, that there is a benefit both to the town and to the inn in terms of um, its continued use and operation. And again, what we're looking at is not telling this board or the towns or the, the town or the neighbors that we're programming this for 250 people every weekend. It's again looking for that capacity to have some room to move that level up and down based on varying events and varying sizes of guests, weddings, and other events that want to come on site. And that's really the basis of um, this application before you, is to get the board's response and uh, direction on that in terms of requesting that level of 260 people, including um, the employees. The last point to raise about our application and our additional request was that the hours that we offered to the board and in fact put in place, put the events um, and shut them off at eight o'clock in the evening. What the inn has found is that they have to start to shut down around seven or 7.15 in order to absolutely accommodate that eight o'clock event because of the wind down time that's associated with the events. And we've asked the board for consideration to allow that eight o'clock <coughs> p.m. to be extended to 9 p.m. 
so that the music and the events still shut off at 8, but there's that additional um, time to actually have the events wind down and get things shut down. That's the second part of our request um, to this board this evening. And again, our, our request on that is one of a point of accommodation, and we're willing to take the board's uh, direction on that in terms of your ability to understand that potential impact and what that means. And if that is not something you're comfortable with, um, we'll follow that direction from you in terms of the operation. And with that, I'll, Greg or Susan, if you have additional comments. If not, I'll turn it back to the board. Thank you. <clears throat> um, let, let me just ask you a question on the traffic. One of the things I, I'm thinking about is I understand there was a prior application, and I remember going through those issues, but there were some differences. The, the new ordinance wasn't into, in effect in terms of a mile for off-site parking. Um, I, I question a little bit the, the traffic study and traffic count because, at least the way I see it, if there's off-site parking, I think there's a very good chance that cars that will end up parking off-site will still come into the facility to drop people off, and so that may change the numbers a bit in terms of traffic. And so I, I don't know whether that's something we may need to look at, or the, whoever did the traffic study may need to look at again. Um, the, the other issues out there is I, I, I understand that I'm sure you'd like for us to discuss this tonight, but uh, I think we need to have a public hearing on this, given the fact that we've already heard from some of the neighbors and had some correspondence, and I certainly would want to give them an opportunity to comment. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, if everyone, not everyone was on the board during the last application, so it's hard to understand the information that was given us then, but um, I think this would be a good time to ask or suggest what further information we may want to see uh, on all these issues, the noise, the traffic, parking, uh, additional hours, et cetera. Yes, Jack. Um, you currently approved for an 8 p.m. shutdown, and you're asking for a 9 p.m. shutdown. But the uh, document here from Monsignor Henschel grants you parking only until 5 p.m. on Saturdays and 6 p.m. on Sundays. So I'd like to understand how you reconcile that. Again, I think the issue on that, we are, um, the chair is correct in terms of our parking on site. We will be shuttling people on and off the site. So there will be an increase in the cars coming on the site as a result of this application. And because of that, we will be doing some valet parking and some remote parking to support this. And the event hours in terms of coordination with um, their policy is that some of these events are early in the day, some of them are later in the day, and not all the parking is going to be at St. Bart's in terms of those functions occurring. So the ability to absorb all the parking on the site exists for the current 176. So the inn's going to work to coordinate that off-site parking with those earlier day events. So would it be fair to assume your intention is that the evening events would not require the parking at St. Bart's? Correct, because the, the, the issue on the event timing is they do want to be able to keep that parking lot open for some of the evening masses at St. Bart's. So they're going to try and coordinate it so that that parking is available on site for those evening events. So that's a, I'm sure this will be a question that's of interest to, to the neighbors. Um, I guess I would interpret what you said to be that the events that would go until 8 or 9 o'clock at night would not have this 216 people in it. So. Under the terms of that lease, that's correct. Okay. How many would it have? What would be the maximum number without using the on-site, the off-site parking? Based on the events, it would be about 150 people in terms of the real, a real size of the van. Susan, you, you have to come just to identify me. yourself and come to the podium. <coughs> I'm the one that manages the uh, events at the end. Um, what we do usually is we only allow about 100 at the most, 100 and a quarter on the side lawn, which is when the um, side lawn events happen later. If 
front lawns all occur between 12 and 5. So all the vehicles from that event are gone. So what the valet parkers do is they take all the vehicles from St. Bart's at 5 o'clock or 4.30 or 5 and they return them all to the inn. And there's usually only like 20, 30 cars at the most, if that, depending on how many cars come in. So everything is back on property so that the people that come from the events want their vehicles, they just get into their vehicles and they go. So that's how we resolve that issue. They're pretty much off the lot at St. Bart's, you know, by five. And there are too many uh, cars at that point because the first events happen between probably nine o'clock in the morning and sometimes they're gone by three. And the other events sometimes happen at three and they go till eight. So they're not always here at the same time. Maybe you can refresh my memory on the, the whole issue, which I know we discussed at length of, of the music in the side lawn and so forth, the time limits on that. The time limits are really independent of the noise issue. The time limits, sorry, the time limits are really posed to frame the use of the inn and keep those uses concentrated. The noise we've really presented to the board as two specific noise levels, one for the side lawn and one for the uh, front lawn. And the acoustic blankets that are put in place and the noise levels on the side lawn are different than the noise levels and the blanketing and acoustics that happen on the front lawn. On the side lawn, there's a specific prohibition in, in the uh, approval against amplified music louder than 50 dB in that side lawn. And the theory on that was with the acoustic blankets and the non-amplified um, music in that side lawn that we knew we could meet the test of the ordinance of 60 dB at the property line. On the front lawn, because of the location on the property, the massing of the other buildings, we do allow, we did get permission from this board to have the amplified music um, up to that uh, I think it's 55 or 58 dB within the tent, knowing that that would attenuate and still meet the 60 dB levels at the side lawns. So that was what we put into the approval process last time. But wasn't there a time? There is a time cut off at 8 o'clock. Right. That, that was something that we had offered um, to the board as part of that approval process because of that sensitivity. And we still are proposing to cut off that noise at 8 o'clock. We would not have any noise source on the grounds after 8. Music, yes. you mean? That, any music, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if they'd want to be referred to as noise, but... That would be right. But that, I think the issue for us was um, attenuating that to meet the 60 dB standard. And the only documentation that we can submit into the record to give this board comfort are the two facts that, number one, the inn has been doing that monitoring and pursuing that. And in fact, there were only two events this past year where it even came anywhere close to bumping that 60 dB level at the property line. Um, and the inn self-monitored those and caught those. So our testimony is the inn has been doing that through their staff rigorously, both through Susan Lake events, but also through the management of the inn. And secondly, we have gone through and checked with the police looking for, specifically looking for, noise complaints from either Richmond Terrace or Bowery Beach Road. And at least talking to um, the police department, we did not find anything on record, nor did they found nothing on record of but, noise But you've been monitoring that since, so perhaps it might be helpful as part of this application to submit that information, if you have it. David. Yeah, I agree that information would be helpful. I, I just want to make sure I understand this. Uh, as far as increasing the number of guests that the inn could have, will that have any impact on the number of guests that would be at an event at the side lawn? They do. What we've, in our submitted material, what we've indicated to you was, in fact, that side lawn number will creep up by 20 or 25 people. I'd have to look back and to get the specific number, but we are bumping that number up and bumping the front lawn number up as well. But it's not the, the, the full number that you're, you're asking for an additional... Uh, Correct. I'm trying to do the math here. 84? 
or so. And it would not, that would not be the number that would, of people that would be increased in the side lawn event or the front lawn event? No, because the side lawn is our greatest acoustic sensitivity. So we, we have very limited ability to put more people in it because there is a linear relationship between baseline noise level and number of people. And we can't get much above about 120 or 125 people before we start to see a baseline increase in the decibels in that, within that tent. Even with the attenuation of the acoustic blankets, it just it starts to push those edges of that study that we know we can't exceed that. So would your data include then that, that type of information that if you added 20 people to an event on the side lawn, what the impact would be on the noise level? We can, we can put that on the record, yes. Okay, I think that would be helpful then, to have that information. If I could ask Susan a, a question. Um, I guess it's kind of a basic one. I, how would people know and when would they know that they can't park at the inn and would have to park at the remote location? How would that be set up? Uh, we have valet parkers and like a head valet coordinator at every event. So there's at least three uh, staff members taking care of the vehicles. Um, there's a person that arrives when they arrive, they greet them and they leave their cars, they take their cars and they park them. And then anything beyond that level gets parked at St. Bart's. So it depends on the actual day, it depends on how many guests are coming in vehicles. Right. Um, it's all relative to that. Now the reason for the um, numbers being the way they are is that people will call me and they'll say, I'd like a party for 100 or 100 and a quarter or 85. What we try to do is we try to, we have that set a number that we can't exceed for the day. So if we have a booking already for 100, we tell them we can only take 75 at the moment. That's how we have to maintain those numbers. But we never know till 10 days before the final guaranteed number. They can't increase beyond those numbers, but they normally go down. So our numbers are usually lower right. but, than our proposed numbers. But, but for traffic purposes, though, it would be correct to say that all of the cars, even if they end up parking off-site will originally come in to the to the inn? I don't, I don't yeah, know. Like just to, on the record, what we said to you is that it's all shuttle parking. That um, The management plan talks about it as shuttle parking. The only thing that Susan and I have discussed, the only people that would drive directly to St. Bart's would be the staff. Right. They're the only folks who drive directly. So you're correct. The majority of this increase would all be additional trip ends. Right, so. okay. That's, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Another question? Just for my own information or edification, um, on the site plan it says acoustic non-amplified music only. Is that, is that a total ban against any amplification of the music in the side line? Dave. I just wanted to direct a question to Maureen. It sounded like we wouldn't need any updated information on the septic issue. Are you, are you comfortable with that assessment? Yeah, I, I happened to be in a meeting, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, that um, the code enforcement officer, Bruce Smith, was at Al Frick, who I believe designed the septic system, or at least knows a lot about it at the end by the sea, and said, oh, by the way, we're asking for this. And he, he assured me that there's more than enough capacity in there to handle it. Um, one of the things he brought up is to keep in mind that it's not a daily flow. It's weekends for a portion of the year. So there's also an opportunity for the system to recover. Um, and the code officer was in the room, and he was comfortable as well with that. So uh, unless the board wants more information in writing, I, I feel that that issue has been satisfied. Well, and, and aside from that, I mean, I, I think... Obviously, it's nice to hear that from them, but in terms of what's actually on the record, from what I remember of the prior application, that the uh, original representation of that was correct, that under the prior application, there was sufficient capacity. Um, there were other issues that had to do with things other than the septic, but that was my recollection. Yes? Do you want to? Sure. This is Greg Schindler from Olympia. 
Um, Marine, you just asked whether Al Frick had, in fact, uh, designed the system. And <clears throat> in meeting with Al, he did design the system, <clears throat> me, as well as has been working with the end to monitor the system. And I've met with him, and he's, I've got all the plans for the, all the chambers and whatnot. And I, my understanding is that uh, both Al has designed the system and has been working with them to help monitor it. It has a fairly sophisticated digital readout that's in the garage where Marine lives. And there's also some monitoring uh, wells, or not wells, but caps that are off the edge of the edge of where like the pool area is. And they do some testing of that water source on a periodic basis and has to report to the town and to the state um, the levels of how the system is working. And according to Al, um, since it's been installed and through all the events that have been done at the end the last couple of years, it's, it's performing very well. I, again, I would suggest just for purposes of creating a, a, a good record for our purposes, if, if he can merely update what he had done before to say what you just said and perhaps provide some of the monitoring information that's been collected, that would help us uh, in looking at that issue. Yeah, Dave. Um, hey, just a couple of comments. Um, time frame. Is this something that you need to pre proceed in order to secure some other events this summer? Is, it, is that what you're... No, as we've, as we've told the board on a number of occasions, this year, other than stuff off the cuff is pretty well booked. It, there might be some things later in the summer, but okay. we're not looking for this to accommodate anything that's been booked right now. The inn is only booking at the 176 level as approved. Um, I, I think there has been some um, correspondence relative to two abutters, and I think in in deference to them, I would recommend that we have a hearing before. It would make me a little more comfortable. The traffic issue, um, you're adding um, possibly somewhere around 24 more cars, and technically um, 48 entrances and egresses. So I'm wondering about your traffic study. Did it have any flexibility for uh, that you did at original? Does it have any anything in it that might give us a little more comfort to know that uh, maybe another traffic study isn't needed? The only thing I can represent to this board is that when Bill Bray, let me back up for a minute. The traffic report looked at two specific things. One was sight distance, safety, entering and exiting, looking left and right. And that report found that the sight distance entering and exiting more than exceeded MDOT um, standards. The other piece that traffic assessments look at is any drop in level of service both on the Bowery Beach Road and our entrance drive. The original traffic report prepared by Bill Bray looked at a potential guest occupancy for these events of up to 200 people. And if you read that report, what he indicates is that even at the higher event numbers, the level of service, in other words, the functioning of that driveway stayed at level of service A. And our representation to you this evening is that even with that change of pushing up to 250 guests or 260 total, you're not going to see a degradation in the level of service in that driveway because of that that, that change, that, uh, as you said, 24 trip ends. It's 24 additional vehicles. It's really somewhere around 45 or 48 trip ends right. is what we end up as additional trips. Um, and again, these are non-peak hour trips. So our representation to you this evening is it takes a tremendous amount to degrade from a level of service A to level of service B, but even that, um, that still functions more than adequately. Well, again, maybe if Mr. Bray can write a letter to that effect. Or, again, so we have something that says from then until now, given this change, I still feel comfortable that the uh, traffic is, is the same. 
and also the fact that we have on file the original application. And if need be, we can refer to that. Yeah, we do. Anything else? Uh, if I might just ask a question of Maureen. Um, didn't a notice go out to the abutters about the hearing for this evening? Yes, they do. Thank you. But there's no help I understand hearing. That, just clarify. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Um, anybody have a, a motion? I have a question first. What is the date of our May meeting? <clears throat> May 18th. Oh. And, and I, I guess I should point out that the deadline for the May 18th meeting is tomorrow. Um, so I think anything from tonight's meeting that's tabled to the May 18th meeting, we're going to have to just work with the applicant to give them a little bit more flexibility on the submission deadline. Yep. We, would, we would appreciate that. The lead time on this would really be gathering up taking and tabulating the acoustical data, but the larger lead time is really tracking down Bill Bray, <laughs> get that letter in place. Just coordinate that. We'll just work on it. Yep. Thank you. It isn't your fault we had to go to the 29th. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you. <laughs> David. I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bowery, Bowery Beach Road for amendments to the previously approved site plan to allow up to 260 guests at outdoor functions and allow functions to operate until 9 p.m. with music ending at 8 p.m. be tabled until the May 18 planning board hearing. At which, yeah. at which time a public hearing will be held. I have a second. Second. <clears throat> Moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay, thank you. For the, just for the benefit yes. of me in recapping this, what I heard the board specifically request was the statement from Albert Frick that verifies on site septic capacity, documentation from Mr. Bray. Performance, right? I think that's what John Yeah, the, you want the monitoring issue. Yeah, info. Yeah. The information from Mr. Bray that performs an assessment based on the 260 level and the impacts on that in terms of trip ends and any changes to um, existing base flow on Bowery Beach Road. The um, backup information on noise. The mo you said you had monitoring yes, information. Yes, tabulation of the monitoring information. Yep. Um, the, the addition of 20 or 25 guests to the noise level, what, what the impact that would be? Correct. Okay. We'll include that as part of the. I think that was it. I would ask, I, I realize we've been tabled, okay, anyway. and I failed to serve my client well with this. We didn't really get much of a feedback on that 8 to 9. Sorry. Am I outside the limits of asking for just comment about, is there, are there major concerns from the board about still cutting the music off at 8, but allowing that motion to run until 9? You know, I, I, at this point, I, I don't really know, but I certainly would like to hear from the neighbors and people that are there and see the information that you've gathered on uh, noise levels and so forth. I, I certainly appreciate the issue that to close something down at 8 means that you have to start a lot earlier than 8 to do that. And I would suspect, although again, I don't know until I see the information, that stopping the music is probably the main issue regarding noise. So if that continues to end at 8, I suspect the noise issue would, would not be a major issue going till 9. Um, but The concern is you'd like to see the attendant change in baseline level with the larger groups, I suspect. If, yeah, if possible. Thank you. Um, we didn't. I, does anyone feel a site walk is necessary? I always have to raise that. No party schedule that we could come to. For. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 
But I want to make a motion to adjourn, but before that, I want to remind everybody that the site it's Saturday morning site walk. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, 8 a.m. at Fowler Road. I make Thank a motion you, we Dave. adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs>